Welcome to Joe Blow Horror Originals Best Foreign Horror, where we take a look at significant horror titles from all over the world. You know, France gets a bad rap as the butt of jokes about cowardice, but that script gets flipped when discussing their horror output, particularly when discussing what became known as the new French extremity set of films that started to appear in the early 2000s. Martyrs, now that's the original, not that dreadful remake, Frontiers, and Inside all deserve a look into and may end up with their own videos, but before them, and the one that I got to see in theaters, came high tension. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'd like to thank you guys for watching Best Foreign Horror, and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. French horror cinema has one of the fullest histories of any country, and it goes back further than most, too. The first French horror film could be the first horror film in general, with George Millet's The Haunted Castle from 1896. It's kinda cool that one of the fathers of film made one of the earliest horror films, too. Pretty much every decade after has a fun piece of horror history from France. I Accused from 1919 follows dead soldiers from World War I coming out of their graves, and was impressive enough to get a remake in 1938. The 1920s would give us a very early Poe adaptation with Fall of the House of Usher in 1928, while the following year would deliver a surreal arthouse classic from Louis Bonnel and Salvador Dali. Even if you don't recognize the name, you know of it. It's the one with the razor slicing the eyeball where they subbed in a cow's eye. The 30s and 40s would deposit some more notable films by creators that I struggle to pronounce, but the late 50s and 60s gave us a couple of landmark titles in Eyes Without a Face and Les Diaboliques. Later in the decade would see the release of an anthology film with American actors like Peter Fonda and Jane Fonda, and British legend Terence Stamp. Spirits of the Dead may not be on the same level as some amicus films in terms of enjoyability, but with directors like Fellini and Vadim, it is certainly a well-made one. The 1970s would give us a good mix of erotic horror films from exploitation master Jess Franco, and some horror thrillers like The Tenant from Roman Polanski, and a really cool Alan de Leon flick called Shock Treatment. No, not the Rocky Horror sequel. Listing all these movies may feel like a little bit of filler, but I do want to spotlight so many films that showcases all the different directors, styles, and subgenres of horror France has gone through. Often they buck trends to create something new, and are never afraid to push boundaries on nudity, gore, or good taste in general. No time frame in French horror history illustrates this push for excess than the new French extremity films. While Inside, Martyrs, and Frontiers are kind of the holy trinity of the late 2000s extreme French horror, and In My Skin, Irreversible, and Trouble Every Day were the beginnings of this era, High Tension was the one that bridged the two together. High Tension opens with one of our two main characters, Marie, in a hospital gown and quite a bit of damage showing while muttering that she won't let anyone get between them again. The credits roll as we see Marie running away from something with blood everywhere. She wakes up in the back of her friend Alexia's car as they are on their way to Alexia's house, and she tells her of the dream that we as the audience just saw. She claims she was barefoot and bloody, but running away from herself. We are introduced to her family before another introduction to a vile sounding man in a truck who's getting a little something extra. He <coughs> dumps her and then drives away. Marie and Alex arrive at the house in time for her little brother's bedtime and have some tea with a chat before they head to sleep after a long day of travel. Marie continually disapproves of Alex's choice in men, offhandedly calling her a slut and other similar derivatives, but also treating her like they're in a relationship as well, even thanking her for finally introducing her to the family. Marie goes out to have a smoke and ends up with her own personal peep show of Alex cleaning up before bed. Heading back inside, Marie gets into bed before enjoying a fantasy about Alex in the first full reveal of Marie's feelings towards her as more than just a friend. As her passion grows, the van with the creepy older man approaches the house. The rest of the family and Alex are all asleep, so nobody hears the truck approach except for the family dog and birds. The driver rings the doorbell, and when Alex's father opens the door, he's immediately assaulted by a hammer, and the dog is also killed. The father stumbles back and is eventually killed in the movie's first big gory set piece. The kill is so stunningly brutal that you're taken aback, and the tension is ratcheted up even further as you realize anyone he encounters will be dispatched with the same brutality. Alex's mom then goes downstairs to see what the commotion is about, and is met with several stabbings before the assailant, known in the credits as Le Tour, or The Killer in English, stalks the upstairs looking for the remaining inhabitants. Marie is able to hide, but you see the methods of this monster as he waits outside the door listening for noise, checks the sink faucet for recent water usage, and looks everywhere for his prey. 
He can't locate Marie, but he wakes up Alex with a razor blade and finishes off the mom with another brutal kill before cutting up the body even more post-mortem. The killer walks away to go after the little brother, and when Marie steps over the mother, her last gasp question is why? Why would this killer do this? Marie finds a gagged and chained Alex while the killer finds and kills her little brother before coming back for Alex and throwing her into his van. The killer makes one more sweep of the house while Marie goes to get Alex from the van. Preparing to kill the man, the van door is instead shut in Marie's face. Apparently he didn't see her in there, and she is coming along for the ride. We see one final sweeping pan of his destruction before we join the girls in the back of the van. Marie tries to comfort Alex, but she recoils and looks horrified. The van stops to get gas, and Marie sneaks out to seek help from the attendant when the killer interrupts them to pick up some booze. The killer, it appears, knows the attendant named Jimmy, and they discuss how busy it's been and the booze refill. You know, pretty normal things, before the killer brutally takes out Jimmy with an as-of-yet-unseen axe. They put me. Marie hides in the restroom and again evades capture, but loses Alex completely while mitigating the damage somewhat when she's able to phone the police. Taking matters into her own hands, Marie grabs a car and goes into pursuit of her friend and captor. She catches up to him while barely surviving a car accident and finds a greenhouse area where he is also looking for her. After a tense standoff, an awesome homemade weapon that would make Negan stand at attention, and some subterfuge from our villain, a gnarly battle takes place that sees Marie violated while ultimately becoming victorious in her fight with her opponent. The police make it to the gas station and review the security footage only to find something truly disturbing. Marie is the only person with the attendant Jimmy, and she is the one that brutally murders him before standing in a haze, switching back and forth between her personalities. Marie lets Alex out of the truck, who of course stabs her and runs off, but not before we finally see the story from Alex's point of view and witness Marie committing the heinous acts. Once Marie is stabbed, all bets are off, and she reverts back and forth from the killer to her own personality. Alex makes it to a motorist who gets a pretty brutal death for his small screen time, a chainsaw to the top half of his body. Alex escapes the car and pulls the biggest chunk of glass I've ever seen from her Achilles tendon, and seems to be about to die when she tells the killer slash Marie that she loves them and jabs a tool through her chest. Marie then starts to whisper that she won't let anyone come between them as it fades back to the hospital where we started and she was saying the same thing. This movie mostly takes place on a small scale with only one or two environments, but that lends itself well to setting up some pretty great set pieces. For my money, the best two parts of High Tension are the first attack on the house and the final chase after Marie loses herself completely. The opening siege on the house showcases some very brutal, very convincing, and very cool gore effects, while also showing the callous monster that our bad guy is. It also adds a lot of drama while setting up who we think our main hero or final girl is, giving Marie character by showing her afraid while also willing to help. The final rampage retains the violence done to the killer while also giving us another fairly ridiculous and well done special effects showcase. The final thing I really enjoy in this movie is that you get hints throughout the film that Marie and the killer are one and the same. From fearful but knowing looks from the family members that she kills, to subtle things like the killer and Marie listening to the same radio station in their cars, there are hints throughout the runtime that allows first time viewers to guess the twist or return watchers to look for and pick up on everything there is to see. Some people point out that many of the situations can't physically happen, but I like to point out the unreliable narrator trope and just go with it. Everything from our point of view takes place in Marie's mind, and the true story we'll never know. In front of the camera, High Tension doesn't have a lot of recognizable faces for American audiences. Cécile de France plays Marie, and she appeared exclusively in French productions up to this movie, while well, after she would show up in the Jackie Chan, Steve Coogan flop Around the World in 80 Days, we are playing. My God. the Jude Law New Pope TV series, and even last year with Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch. My one, apologies for that pronunciation, who plays Alex, would be best known, though only now after I tell you, as the blue alien singer harboring one of the titular elements in Luc Besson's film The Fifth Element. Philippe Nahon, who gives my favorite performance of the film, with the least dialogue, has been acting since 1962 and would get an astounding 228 credits before his death in 2020. Looking over his career, this crowd probably has also seen him in Gaspar Noé's depressingly powerful Irreversible. Of course, the most famous of this crew is easily writer-director Alexandra Aja. Aja would go on to make the remake for Hills Have Eyes, which is a brutal but pretty good remake, Mirrors starring Kiefer Sutherland, the ridiculous Piranha 3D, the wonderful killer croc movie Crawl, and last year's claustrophobic thriller Oxygen. 
He also co-wrote P2 from 2007 and the remake of Maniac from 2012. Often getting lost in the shuffle is Aja's frequent writing and producing collaborator Gregory Lavasseur, who co-wrote and produced many of Aja's work and directed the found footage movie Pyramid in 2014. High Tension doesn't get discussed nearly enough anymore, but nearly 20 years after its release, it should be looked at as a 21st century horror classic that started the overly graphic part of the new French extremity and launched the career of director Alexandre Aja, who has given us a solid list of genre titles. Love it or hate it, it lives on as one of the best foreign horrors.